This episode is brought to you by Tegas. Over the years of our partnership with Tegas, they have evolved from a pure expert network into a full company intelligence platform. Tegas streamlines the investment research process so you can get up to speed and find answers to critical questions on companies faster and more efficiently. The Tegas platform surfaces the hard to get qualitative insights, gives instant access to critical public financial data through BAMSEC, and helps you set up customized expert calls. It's all done on a single modern SaaS platform that offers 360 degree insight into any public or private company. As a listener, you can take Tegas for a free test drive by visiting tegas.co slash Patrick. And until 2023, every Tegas license comes with complimentary access to BAMSEC by Tegas, which makes it easy to search and analyze public company filings and transcripts. This episode is brought to you by Scribe, the trusted transcription provider for the business and investing community. Scribe powers call transcription, closed captioning, and more with best-in-class accuracy, speed, and security. Scribe is designed to accurately transcribe messy real-world audio and is unique in that it's optimized for complexities of enterprise audio, such as company and product names, currencies, accents, and numbers. Scribe is the chosen transcription service for all of S&P Global, including CapIQ Pro and clients like leading market intelligence platform Tegas. Visit kenshow.com slash breakdowns to learn more and unlock your free trial. You can also get in touch directly via scribe at kensho.com. That's scribe at K-E-N-S-H-O.com. This is Business Breakdowns. Business Breakdowns is a series of conversations with investors and operators diving deep into a single business. For each business, we explore its history, its business model, its competitive advantages, and what makes it tick. We believe every business has lessons and secrets that investors and operators can learn from, and we are here to bring them to you. To find more episodes of Breakdowns, check out joincolossus.com. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions. Hosts and podcast guests may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. This is Matt Russell, and today we are breaking down the financial institution known as Charles Schwab. Schwab is a financial behemoth. They report over $8 trillion in assets under management and a market cap scratching $120 billion. But I think the most fascinating part about this breakdown is the strategic pivot taken by Schwab. While the online brokerage market has been decimated in recent years from fee compression, Schwab has been pivoting their business model to that of a traditional bank. Now, what does that mean? Today, Schwab makes the majority of their money earning interest on customer cash deposits. To break down Schwab, I'm joined by Holland Advisors founder and portfolio manager, Andrew Hollingworth. Andrew has written extensively on Schwab, which we will link to in our show notes. We cover what it means to operate as a bank versus an online broker, how Charles Schwab himself grew this business out of a newsletter, and what's on the horizon for Schwab in the future. Hope you enjoy this breakdown of Charles Schwab. All right, Andrew, welcome to Business Breakdowns. Thanks very much indeed. It's a pleasure to be here. Before we hit record, you were telling me that Schwab is not well understood by the market. And I think that's a great place to kick off. I'm a generalist outsider. I would think of Schwab as an old school brokerage, business driven by AUM, investors are going to value it on book value. It probably has a high correlation to interest rates. Is that a fair characterization or where am I wrong? And how does that relate to the general market and how they understand Schwab? The key thing I would say is if you were to listen to an analyst call or sort of the quarterly calls that Schwab has with analysts and investors, then you're going to hear quite a long debate about net interest margin, about balance sheets. Yeah, if you are a Schwab customer, that's not your experience at all. Your experience as a Schwab customer is very similar to that. As an Amazon customer, you're getting a great deal. You're possibly having a lot of volume of your investments lodged with them, either by way of an intermediary in an RIA or direct with them themselves. And you don't pay very much for that. So you're pretty delighted that you're getting a lot of service for not a lot of money. That's how I think about this business. This is the sort of Amazon of finance, if you like, in the sense that they are investing and growing and investing and growing, and more and more customers come back to them because of the fact that they are giving the customer a great deal. But that's not the questions and answers that 
the analysts give. And I think that's the interesting bit is the disconnect between what the analysts analyze the company as being and what the customer finds when they click on the Schwab website. I like that characterization, certainly the Amazon of this world certainly carries strong weight and we should dive into that a bit. Before we go any further, this is the first business breakdown on a company that keeps the name of its founder. And I'd love to learn a little bit more about Charles Schwab himself before we go any further. How active and influential has his tenure in the business been? And maybe you can tell us a little bit about the history, Schwab starting this business to where it got today, and then we can dive into how it differentiates from the rest of the industry. For a living, I write investment research, which I sell to investment clients, and I manage for a fund as well. And the reason I mention that is because that's the beginning of Charles Schwab as an individual as well. So in the late 1960s, basically writing an investment newsletter and was selling that to all sorts of different people. And what's quite interesting about that is that he was basically a user. He knew what it cost to buy and sell shares on the New York Stock Exchange. And he wasn't very happy about that and wasn't very happy about the sort of closed shop that existed as he saw it in terms of being able to win over clients or being able to execute trades at sort of low cost. What was very interesting, and I forget the year, I think it's maybe 1975 or something, is that when the stock exchange was deregulated and ultimately within reason, anybody could be a member and could exchange, Charles Schwab as an individual knew exactly what that meant. And for anyone wanting to do a bit more work, I really recommend the Invested book, which is written by Charles Schwab himself. And it was released maybe two or three years ago now, a couple of years ago. And I was reading it at the same time that Bob was taking over TD Ameritrade. And to read his words of what he was thinking in 1975 or 1980 about competition, about reinvestment in price, about regulation, at exactly the same time that he's doing the same thing all over again in the late 2000s was a really insightful piece of history repeating itself today but also the ethos of an owner-manager and a founder that still lives through today. The ethos that he brings to the company still exists. When you quarterly calls, he's not on the different quarterly calls, but when you talk to the management team, they're very honest about how much time they spend discussing key strategic moves in the company with him. And I just think the ethos that he has had lives throughout this business. You mentioned the name above the door, I don't want to mention the name of competitive companies, but I think there is another business in this sector that has held itself on a rob from the rich and give to the poor. And I think they didn't necessarily do that. They arguably promoted a more speculative mentality towards investing. And I think it's very, very interesting that when your name's above the door, how you behave. And I think both Charles Schwab behaves and has behaved impeccably. And I think the business that carries his name, I think, behaves impeccably as well. Yeah, it sounds like he was an original of multiple emerging trends that we see today with a paid newsletter many, many years ago and the discount brokerage model, two things that we've certainly seen reinvigorated with the evolution of today. Let's get a little bit into the business itself, how they operate, how they make money. I've always been curious, as you've seen discount brokerage models where fees continue to come down, trading commissions basically zero today. How is Schwab making money? And maybe how does that relate relative to the competition? I once heard Buffett talk about American Express and how everybody thinks they're American Express's worst customer. And the reason for that is they pay their bills off on time and they just use all the points. Therefore, how can American Express make any money out of them? And the honest truth is obviously American Express makes their money out of the merchant fee that the merchant pays to attract you in as a wealthy American Express cardholder, if you like. But that win-win for everybody, as in the customer thought they were getting a fantastic deal, was a really powerful business model, which stuck with me when Buffett described it. Schwab is exactly the same. Schwab feels like it's free because you really don't pay very many charges in terms of custody. You pay nothing to buy and sell your underlying securities, as you described earlier on. So therefore, how does Schwab make its money? It makes the majority of its money on the net interest margin. The reason why the analysts spend all their time talking about it is because movements in interest rates affect the profitability of the money that Schwab's customers have on deposit. Simplistically, if you're a Schwab customer or you're a Wells Fargo customer, there is an amount of money sitting in your current and deposit accounts. And that amount of money you will be paid 0.1% interest on if you're lucky. 
And if interest rates are 2% or 3%, the bank will learn the difference. That's what net interest margin is. Schwab obviously sits on lots and lots of customer assets because it's sitting on saving assets. And on average, about 10% of those assets are sitting in cash. That money sitting in cash earns them less money when interest rates are low, more money when interest rates are high. But on average, it probably contributes 60 to 75% of their income. The result being that they earn modest amounts of income from other lines of the business, which is why the customer thinks they're getting such a great deal, because the majority of Schwab's income is coming from effectively 10% of customer assets, where the customer's not even paying a fee on, they're just foregoing some interest rate benefit. Understood. There's some similarities to when we think of insurance float with Berkshire, the ability to take on these deposits and then reinvest them at higher rates. Certainly an attractive business. I'm curious, you mentioned about 60 to 70% of the business's revenues come from net interest margins on these deposits. Where does the other 30% come from? And is that standard for the industry to have that 60 to 70% range? Or are many of the competitors generating 100% of their revenues from net interest margins? They come from a variety of different areas. They come from lending fees. They come from custody fees. The comparison with peers is really difficult and different because everybody does it slightly differently. You've got a lot of examples where businesses are asset light businesses. Let's say Hargreaves Lansdowne in the UK, which is a business that is effectively a platform for buying and selling securities on. It doesn't make that much money from net interest income because it's basically running as an asset light business where that money is put out onto banks' balance sheets. It is making much, much more money from the fee it charges in terms of you want your ISA with us, you want your 401k with us, then we'll charge you a fee for that. This is where the complexity builds and where the comparison with peers breaks down a little bit. There are very, very few situations whereby you've got a company that's effectively making the vast majority of its money from something that the customer doesn't almost realize or value that much, if you like. And in a situation where the business is an asset light business, which is, say, what TD Ameritrade was with the business that Schwab bought then that business doesn't have the scale of balance sheet that can keep the deposits in-house that can then earn the full spread on those deposits. TD Ameritrade did earn some money in net interest income, but nothing like as much as Schwab. And the reason for that is it put those assets out onto a balance sheet, which was owned by TD Dominion Bank. So if you look at its percentage of income that came from the interest margin, it was much lower. It was much more reliant on fees for custody fees and much more reliant on fees for trading fees which is when it then looks more vulnerable when someone like a competitor like Schwab undercuts those fees and reduces those fees. Is the easy way to describe the asset light versus asset heavy, thinking about it in a franchise model where these franchises that might be operating have control over their own assets, but are paying a fee up to whatever the master entity is, if it's a TD Ameritrade, if it's one of the Schwab competitors, where they are getting those fees, but they're not able to take advantage of the net interest margins on the actual customer deposits. Is that the right way to think about it? Yeah, you could look at it that way. And I suppose the point I'd make here is that seems like a really good idea. So if I said to you, there's two types of businesses in terms of the asset custody business. There's the asset light business, which was TD Ameritrade as was and Hargreaves Lansdowne as it is today, where you clip customers for a very small percentage of their asset value They're generally happy to pay it. They're very sticky customers. And you pay 100% of that out in dividend or share buyback because it's a very asset-like business model. Equally, there's an asset-heavy business model over here that involves building an incredibly complicated bank-type balance sheet that has to be regulated by the SEC and everyone else. And we're not going to charge customers very much. And we're just going to make quite a volatile revenue stream that comes from that interest income line that goes up or down. If I tried to present those to you, I think you would always want me to have the former, not the latter. And that's where it's very interesting is that Charles Schwab effectively had the former. They had an asset like business that they chose 25 years ago to take asset heavy. And I think you need to think about why you do that and what that means and the effect on the customer and all the rest of it. It is part of building an incredibly resilient and powerful franchise, but it isn't necessarily something that from the outside you would be attracted to have done years ago or even be attracted to today. But getting to the ethos as to why you do that starts to get to understanding the difference of this business and some of the competitors. Yeah, I think 
if we put it in U.S. head fund terms, there's the two and the 20 that get charged. And the two is a percentage of AUM. AUM can oftentimes be very sticky and you have good visibility into that earning stream. You're typically willing to put a higher multiple on that versus the 20, which is obviously much more speculative in nature, very hard to predict how much you're actually going to generate in profits. And that's often going to warrant a lower multiple. I think here, I would assume historically an asset like model was going to be sending up a steady fee stream and something in that thesis broke down. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that. What did Schwab see in terms of what was historically the better model in the asset light franchise model, which was sending fees up and much less capital intensive? What did he see happening that caused him to shift and push into the more capital intensive and bank-like model that he operates today? What I think he saw is he saw a profit pool and a profit pool that can come from sticky customer assets. Because the danger is here is that we make analogies with sort of other businesses and then you lose a little bit of the nuance in the middle. So earlier on, describing the interest margin, and I said, well, Schwab's like this and then Wells Fargo's like that and so on. But the difference between maybe a Schwab account and a Wells Fargo current account is that people tend not to take their money out of their savings accounts, whereas people do tend to take their money out of their current accounts. So when you're modeling a bank's net interest margin, there's a certain amount of leakage that you look at as to how much money might stay and how much money might go and so on. Different type of accounts have got different amounts of leakage. But the money that stays in savings accounts is really high. And the reason it does is because you've got $50,000 or something invested in your account. And if $5,000 of that is sitting in cash, well, you're thinking, well, I'm going to invest that tomorrow or the day after or the day after and so on. And actually, as the market goes down, you get a bit more cautious and maybe there's $10,000 sitting in there. And all the while you're thinking about what to do with it and don't actually get around to it, and someone else does the same, they're earning an interest margin on that. But what you don't tend to do is take the money out of your 401k to have it sitting somewhere else. What I think I've seen them be attracted to over time is that incredibly sticky deposit that isn't going anywhere and being able then to make a margin on that sticky deposit But crucially, at the same time, therefore give the customer a better deal in all other parts of the business by giving them free trading, by giving them great access to other products at low fees, charging them very low custody rates. And I think that's the bit that's crucial is that we could talk in a minute, if you like, about what happened when Schwab bought TD Ameritrade. And I think investigating that transaction will tell you a lot about the competitive dynamics of this industry. because asset heavy company took over asset light company in the blink of an eye because asset heavy company i charles schwab cut its cost of dealing to zero and everyone else's share prices went down because that's what everyone else's revenue stream was based upon now if you hadn't spent 25 years building up an asset heavy balance sheet that had an income stream from interest income you wouldn't have been able to do that maybe but they had and they did and i think that is the sort of complexity in history around what happened and why it was able to happen if you like I definitely want to get into that. There's an interesting point here that you're referencing where Schwab seems to benefit the most when a customer's assets have a larger portion in cash, where they might be earning the smallest amount in terms of what they're getting paid on that cash, but it's certainly a higher return opportunity versus if that cash was invested in securities. Is that the right way to think about it? It just seems to create some misalignment with the customer base. So I'm just curious if I'm thinking about that properly, where they're really not generating anything if that cash is invested, but they are when it's on the sidelines. That is, I think, factually correct. But I think to spend time thinking about, well, that means they're more interested in customer A rather than customer B, and they don't want people to invest, I think is a fruitless exercise. It's a little bit like saying Amazon earns more money on delivering a watch to my house than it does bottled water. So they don't want to deliver bottled water to me. Well, actually, Amazon will deliver anything and everything. And I think that's where the analogies come, is that this is a company that's trying to do everything. It talks about win-win monetization for the customer. It talks about no trade-offs. What it means by that is no trade-off between paying a low price or no price for doing something and still getting excellent service. This is a business that set itself up to try and do an excellent job for the customer and whatever the customer asks it to do. And the way it earns its money is not connected to that or is an adjunct to that, if you like. The way you describe it is factually correct, but I know that's not how they think about the business. Yeah, I can understand that. It's uh, 
full product suite and you don't get the deposits on that overall base of money if you're not offering the other services. So you can't think about incentivizing to have more cash held on hand. That makes a lot of sense. And the shift that they've made and why they have been successful or why it it better sets them up in times like today makes sense as fees are coming down. What stops competitors from just mirroring this business model? First things first, you've got to have a competitor that's got a similar scale advantage to be able to flex that scale advantage against them, if you like. In theory, we've had platform fees have come down, cost of dealing has come down. So the next thing that will happen is that there'll be a price war maybe over interest fees and the interest fee that you get on your account. And of course, that's possible. And actually, I think interactive brokers, obviously, some of their adverts talk about margin costs and how their margin costs are cheaper than people like Fidelity or Swap or somebody else. But at some point in time, some economic return is going to be made by a network of some size or other. Another credit card company or charge card company could have set up to compete with American Express and charged a lesser merchant fee. But there is a point at which that doesn't work because the scale required and the number of cards at issue required or the number of customers required in order to make a profit at that level of merchant fee just doesn't work because you'd have to lose money for 20 years before you got to the level of scale required. That's where the Amazon analogies and things are relevant in the sense that in order to do everything that Charles Schwab do, and only to make money on that small slither of capital that's sitting there when the customer doesn't do anything with it, because if they put it straight on term deposit, you don't make money on that. It's only on the little bits that nothing's happening with that they've swept onto their own balance sheet. In order to do that, you need a very, very large pool of assets to do that with. So there's nothing to stop anybody doing it, but you'd have to build a business of similar size and scope. And I don't see anything anywhere near it. There's one other bit which is important that we touch upon. And that is the fact that having built up the size of balance sheet, because there was a time when Schwab had money that was not on its balance sheet, a little bit like TD Ameritrade that was earning interest income off of, but obviously it was giving up some of that interest income to another bank that effectively took the risk of those assets, if you like, and those assets on its balance sheet. But what Schwab has done both significantly pre the TD Ameritrade and then after the TD Ameritrade deal as well, is it is sweeping more and more and more of those client cash assets onto its own balance sheet. And therefore, it has to hold the appropriate level of capital on its balance sheet to do that. So building a business that competed with Schwab is very different to building a business that competes with, say, Hargreaves Lansdowne in the UK. Because you not only have to build the network of clients and systems and all of that, you also have to build the regulated bank balance sheet that's got whatever is $580 billion on it to make sure that you have got the regulatory capital and approvals, et cetera, to go with that. So the level of complexity and the level of financial commitment is pretty significant. That's a great point. I think maybe you can hammer that home. In the case of some of these competitors, TD Ameritrade, prior to being acquired here, what are the mechanics in terms of the cash that is on the balance sheet? Because you do have a similar setup where some percentage of client assets are going to be in cash. It sounds like they're not able to reap the same net interest margin from those investors because of certain capital requirements. So where does that potential profit opportunity go? I think you alluded to other banking relationships, but if you could just actually get into the weeds there and talk about the mechanics of where that profit opportunity is realized, I think it would really hammer home the point of how Schwab differentiates itself. Well, I'm not an E-Trade specialist, but I did look at TD Ameritrade a lot, both pre and post the merger. But my understanding is that E-Trade and TD Ameritrade have exactly the same model, which is effectively, it's an asset-like model where you're charging small fees for different transactions and for different custody or whatever else. And you are making some income from your net interest income. But because you don't have a balance sheet, or you don't have a regulated bank balance sheet, that money that's on deposit with you sits off your balance sheet. So by definition, you might be earning 10s, 20s, 30s basis points in terms of what you're getting from that bank to basically say, thank you for sending that deposit base to them. Well, that's rather different to earning 150 basis points, what Schwab earned in 2020, up to sort of 250 basis points, which is what they earned in 2019, or even 400 basis points, which is what they earned before the credit crunch. These are big differences in margin. And when you start to look at those, you can then start to see why the vast majority of the business is able to be funded by that line alone. Well, 
that line just doesn't exist or do anything like the magnitude for an asset like business. That makes total sense. And interesting, especially in today's context, I think the discount brokerages that were particularly popular in the early 2000s, that's the case. I think there's an interesting parallel here with neobanks and how they operate with what's on their balance sheet versus the partnerships that they have. So it all relates. I think it's a great opportunity to transition into the TD Ameritrade acquisition. And I think you've laid the groundwork for why it made a ton of sense and why there would be a massive synergy opportunity here. Maybe you can walk through the thinking behind that, how that went down and the opportunity that that creates and whether that's a replicable model that could be repeated again in the future. Could it be repeated again in the future? In theory, yes. In practice, in terms of recent Q&A, the company's talked about really focusing on integrating that and getting that working well rather than doing anything new. So I wouldn't expect anything in the near term. As I alluded to earlier on, I think the events that led up to the bid for TD Ameritrade are really, really interesting. The sequence of events was that interactive brokers in a very small proportion of its customers, which was a small portion of direct retail customers, I think weren't on margin, whatever it was, it was a small slither of their customers, announced that they would do stock exchange trading in New York for zero commission. Schwab, by their admission, had looked at doing this for a while and were trying to decide when was the right time to do it, when wasn't the right time to do it. On the back of that, Schwab went, let's go for it. And as a consequence, of it, Schwab then went across its entire network and basically said, okay, the cost of buying and selling securities in America is now zero. And I forget when this was, I think this was summer 2018. And the result was that its share price fell, whatever it was, 9% or something, and its competitor share prices in terms of TD Ameritrade and E-Trade and a couple of others fell much, much more than that. Because we've alluded to earlier on, they were much, much more reliant on fee income, effectively, or trading income for their revenue lines. There was an interview, actually, with the founder of Interactive Brokers afterwards, Thomas Pedafy, where he basically confessed and said, I was just gobsmacked. He said, we sort of did it as a marketing stunt. We did it as something trying to attract a certain type of customer, but it was a small amount of our customers. I couldn't believe that Schwab did it across the board. We, in some of our research pieces, describe Schwab as a gorilla in the sector. And that's exactly what gorillas do. They just grab hold of something and just drive it as low as they possibly can in terms of cost and value to the customer. And then everyone else just gets killed in the wake, if you like. And that's exactly what happened. And what was fascinating to me is, I forget exactly what the share price was, but TD Ameritrade share price fell, let's say 25% there or thereabouts, as a consequence of this news. About 12 weeks later, or about three to six months later, let's say, to be prudent, Schwab announces a bid for TD Ameritrade. What was fascinating to me is that TD Ameritrade's board unanimously approved the takeover by Schwab, even though it was happening at the share price that TD Ameritrade was trading at just before Schwab announced its zero cost trading. Now, I'm not criticizing the board for doing that. They had no choice. But for me, it's really, really interesting to see the different behaviors of different people in the market with different powers. Because going into that, if we'd have spoken to different investors maybe the year before, they'd have had said, well, you know, Schwab's one business and it's a bit asset heavy and Meritrade's a different business, a bit more trading revenue, but it's asset light. And they wouldn't have seen them to be gorilla and a person that would get quickly subsumed, if you like. Yet that's what happened when the person that had the most strength in the balance sheet chose to take trading commissions to zero. What was also interesting is that TD Dominion Bank, which is the bank that TD Ameritrade were using for their deposit sweeps, also voted in favor of the deal, then took Schwab stock in the deal. And also then soon after that, renegotiated with Schwab to basically give Schwab a better deal than TD Ameritrade had had on their net income suite, basically. The reason for that, I don't know exactly, but you could argue that Schwab was in a strong position with TD Dominion Bank because it had its own balance sheet and it could discuss whether or not those assets would come onto its balance sheet, which is now happening, or whether some of them could stay with TD Dominion. TD Ameritrade didn't have that discussion because they didn't have their own balance sheet. So it's been really interesting to watch the power of transaction and basically all the cards ended up being in one player's hands. The last thing I'd say about that transaction is what's been very interesting is what's been said after it. Those that want to understand Schwab well should go and listen to the investor day that happened. Schwab have a lot of investor days. They're very good at communicating with the market. Well, they had an investor day in the spring of 2021, which was just after the TD Ameritrade deal had completed. And the language that they then started to use about the business was 
somewhat different from the language you might use when you're during regulatory approval, if you like. They talked about win-win monetization. They talked about client segmentation, things that mean that they can make more profits out of the network, which they hadn't really talked about before. And they also talked about the RAA business and how basically TD Ameritrade was their biggest competitor. And they were delighted to basically subsume that biggest competitor into Schwab, which is a perfectly reasonable statement and an accurate statement, but obviously not one they necessarily were making during the regulatory approval process. Yeah, it's a really interesting case study. I think we've seen it in history where you have an Amazon who cuts shipping costs to zero. And they were somewhat starting at a point of power where they're already a gorilla in the room. And you hear a move like that or increasing the minimum wage, and you can only imagine how competitors feel about it. In this case, it doesn't sound like Schwab was in this position of power or perceived as having the advantageous business model that could pull something like this off. But to see how it played out, I mean, it's just incredible strategic moves that all played into their favor. You mentioned a little bit about interactive brokers, which I think brings up an interesting point about the customer base. When I think of TD Ameritrade, I think of mostly retail customers. When I think of interactive brokers, I think about that in the middle between retail and institutional, where it's the large hedge funds of the world, but certainly more active traders. What does Schwab's customer base look like? And maybe talk a little bit about how they're adding customers to the platform, especially when as a customer, if I see free trading fees across the board, it's hard to differentiate. Maybe talk a little bit about that customer mix and customer base. I think about 65% of their assets from the RIA business, and that creates about a third of their income. So it's a less profitable segment for them. And then the balance is in retail. Also, I don't spend a lot of time on customer segmentation. I mean, one thing I would say that came out of that investor day that I referred to in the spring of 2021 was a really interesting point on that, where they showed a slither of X percent, whatever it was, 8%, 10%, whatever it was, of their customers were basically either what they called ultra net worth individuals. And it was fascinating to me that you would have people with really sizable levels of wealth basically on the Schwab platform. And the reason they've been attracted to Schwab is because it's so low cost and they're not paying all the custody fees and the other fees they'd have to pay Morgan Stanley or BlackRock or anybody else. And they've all come for the same experience and the same product. Now it's about, well, what actually can I do with those people now I've got them? As and when I dug out the customer segmentation stuff to answer your question, I think it's going to be a much broader cross-section of society than you think it is. So TD Ameritrade was more trading sort of orientated customer that used TD Ameritrade more and Schwab was the more mutual fund holder, buy and hold, long-term 401k type pension type customer. You've now got a big mix of customers all in that pot and how you service them is going to be about segmentation and about a certain amount of upselling that can take place to different people. My personal experience was starting a job where my employer required my personal account to be opened at Fidelity. And I've never really had any reason to move it off of Fidelity since then, especially as commissions went to zero. How do they go about selling or getting more customers onto the platform? Because I can certainly understand if you're taking the value proposition of working with traditional wealth manager where the fee structures are going to look a lot different and you're certainly going to be paying for a lot of the services at these major institutions. But if you're going to compare it to discount brokerages, now it's kind of a level playing field where you have free trading fees across the board. So maybe talk a little bit about the sales process, what that actually looks like and how they build share that way or even maintain share that way. I slightly disagree with your premise, actually. I think it's a little bit like saying that you can get cheap milk in any supermarket. Why do you go to one supermarket over the other? And I don't think that's quite right. What you've got is a business where they are trying to offer the best combination of yes value but also customer service, also technology, also branches if you want them, also tax advice if you want it. So you are getting everything that you could want. You just don't have to pay very much for it or anything for it at all, depending on what type of client you are. And it's that sort of complex trade-off of lots of different low price points, good levels of service and all the rest of it that a customer makes a decision on. The customer is sophisticated and the customer is in the process year after year after year of rewarding businesses that give them great service stroke value trade-offs. There's a chart in the most recent presentation by the company that 
shows that their average customer assets, organic, i.e. outside of M&A, have grown between 5 to 7% per annum between 2007 and Q1 2022. That's customers turning up because they like that combination. Yeah, perhaps that's my original question was underselling the ancillary services or everything else you get beyond just a trading platform with free commissions. And the other thing is you don't need to leave. We've got different platforms for different reasons, but they might need to leave if they want something else. They might need to leave if they want tax advice. And all these businesses are trying to do is if you've got a relationship with Morgan Stanley or with anybody else, you probably don't need to leave because Morgan Stanley can give you every piece of advice you'd ever want in terms of tax advice or inheritance advice, everything that you could possibly want, Morgan Stanley can probably provide for you. The only issue is that you pay for that. And what Schwab are doing is basically giving people less and less reasons to leave and more and more reasons to come. And I think that the stickiness you mentioned earlier on the Fidelity account is absolutely right. People do have very, very sticky relationships with their money managers. They do churn a little bit. And if they are churning, they're tending to be churning to save money on the cost line. One of our pieces of research is up on our website. We were looking at the RAA business and looking at why people do or don't use the Schwab RAA business. There was a really good Wall Street Journal article for a couple of years ago where there was an RAA guy that used to be based at Merrill's and had gone set up on his own after about 10 years. And he quoted that he thought he was saving his clients between 15 and 20 basis points per annum in terms of having them on the Schwab platform rather than inside Merrill Lynch. So what is that? That's, again, win-win monetization because the broker wants to set up on his own because he can have the freedom. He can use the Schwab platform to do all the backhaul systems for his independent business that he's established, but he can still go to his customer and set up, say, 20 basis points. That is good for everybody, but it only works if you've got the scale of assets, the scale of network, you've invested in the network, you've invested in the balance sheet. And that's very easy to say and very easy to sort of critique. It's probably damn difficult to do. There's certainly a stickiness here, which plays a major role. How has the market share trended over time? Obviously, there's a big step up with the acquisition of TD Ameritrade, but did this thesis manifest itself with growing market share prior to that acquisition over the previous five or 10-year period? Was there a way to monitor that? It's risen pretty much every year for every period of time in terms of the client custody numbers I talked about earlier on. I think they were at 6% in 2018 or so pre the TD Ameritrade deal and then had organic growth and they've done the TD Ameritrade deals and they're now at more like 12%. This is a business that's been growing market share for a very, very, very long time. The other bit that it's been growing, which we haven't talked about yet, but we need to, is that it's also been growing its customer deposits. And that's been the crucial part of the business's evolution in the sense that we talked about the need to create a balance sheet, but we also need to talk about how that balance sheet grows over time because you can't decide to take all of your client assets on balance sheet because you won't have a big enough balance sheet to do so. So over time, they've had to not only build customers as they've done organically, the way that we described to get to your 12% market share, they've also built deposits on their balance sheet and then equity on their balance sheet to give them the regulatory capital against those deposits. And that's something that the investors need to understand because that's very, very non-traditional thing to do. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about that. My basic level understanding would be if you have a customer bringing their money over to your platform, that's going to represent the deposit. So what has to happen outside of that? If I move my account over, there's some level of cash that comes in, and I would assume that's classified as a deposit and sits on the balance sheet. What else goes into building a balance sheet that wouldn't just be customers moving their accounts over? The crucial point is that If at the very beginning of Schwab's life, it had a bank balance sheet, as in with billions of dollars of assets, and every customer it took in, the deposit sat on a balance sheet, then that would be an easy way to think about the business because it would retain capital as equity against that deposit. So simplistically, if I've got $100 worth of client deposits, I need to sit from the regulatory perspective on, say, $4 of regulatory capital. Regulatory capital being cash. No regulatory capital being shareholder equity, effectively. So a little bit like JP Morgan's tier one equity ratios and all the rest of it, Schwab is regulated like a bank. If you want to have bank assets on your balance sheet, deposits or loans, you have to have the requisite amount of regulatory capital, i.e. tier one equity capital on your balance sheet. If when you start to run deposits on your balance sheet, you don't have enough regulatory capital 
you can't take all the deposits on your balance sheet in one go. What Schwab did is they basically swept customer deposits off of, let's say, other banks onto their own balance sheet in time. So they'll have put something on your account that said, do you mind if we keep your cash in our own balance sheet? We've got a credit rating of XYZ. As long as you've said you've accepted that, then over time, they've swept more and more and more customer deposits onto their own balance sheet, which has enabled them to earn a larger net interest margin on those. But they have grown at a faster rate than accounts. Schwab's bank deposits have grown at 30% per annum or grew at 30% per annum between 2007 and 2020. So that was growing at a faster rate than, let's say, the 7% growth in customers. And as a consequence of that, they are making more absolute money in terms of the net interest margin they make on that money that's now on their balance sheet. But they have to put enough capital up against that. So Schwab not only went from an asset light to an asset heavy balance sheet, it stayed asset heavy as it had to retain more and more and more capital in the business, which is why, for me, one of the crucial points of the analogy between the Amazon point is the stock market can't get it because it's actually a bank. It run the businesses day to day like Amazon, but in terms of regulatory perspective and analytical perspective and credit analysts and all the rest of it, it has to be run like a bank. Therefore, as the deposit base has grown and grown and grown and grown, rather than have the payout ratio of income that would be 70%, 80% that might come from a network asset that E-Trade or TD Ameritrade or Hargreaves Lansdowne might pay out, they, for quite a long period of time up until 2020, were paying out only 30% or so of their net income. The reason being is the rest sat inside the company to build capital, to act as collateral against the bank deposits. It's a really important point. So I want to make sure we outline it as simplistically and accurately as possible. That tier one equity capital, if you think about when you're a bank, what you have to protect against is liquidity. If someone wants to withdraw, banking regulation wants to make sure that there's adequate liquidity in the bank such that that can be withdrawn. Tier one equity capital, I might have oversimplified by stating it was just cash, but it is a combination of cash, reserves, other securities that are left remaining in the business, which that bank then has access to and therefore protects against any issues around liquidity. Whereas if you're not classified as a bank, you don't have that same regulatory requirement in order to hold that capital in the business. Is that a fair description? That's absolutely correct. The issue is how the rubber meets the road, how the two meet. You've got a business that to all extents and purposes, is a sort of platform, makes 45% pre-tax margins. But as it's bringing more and more and more customer money onto its own balance sheet, it's having to build regulatory capital. So the amount of retained bank capital as a percentage of net income, let's say in 2014, 15, and 16, was 90%, 100%, 130%. So you needed to keep all your net income in the business in order for your regulatory capital to be big enough to take these deposits in. The crucial point, which I think is a great danger of getting lost here, is that, so let me read a quote to you that came from Walt Bettinger, if I can, chief executive. So this was in October 2018. And he said, and that sort of takes us in some ways to what is a new chapter that we haven't seen at Schwab for quite a number of years in terms of our ability to award our owners. Right now, we're on the cusp of being in a position to begin returning capital to our stockholders in quite a meaningful way. Now, that is in the piece that we wrote in March 2019, and that piece is on our website. And what we were getting at then was the bulk of period that required to build that huge amount of bank capital has come to an end or was coming to an end. So from then on, they were going to be attracting customer rates at 7 or 8%. The deposit would also grow at 7 8%, and you would have to retain the appropriate capital against that. But that was very different to growing customers at 7 or 8% and growing deposits at 30%. So you would then have a situation where a business might be growing its profitability in the mid-teens, which is what we think happens to throb over a long period of time, but was paying 65% of that out in either share buybacks or dividend income. And that was very interesting to us because that was a period that we thought that Schwab might therefore become a much, much more popular share because it had the Amazon type characteristics, it had the growth, but it was about to become a dividend payer or a share buybacker rather than someone that just forever made profit on paper, but kept it all inside the company. So that moment 
we thought was about to occur, or I thought was about to occur, and then the TD Ameritrade deal happened. Now you've gone back into another period of time of the business reinvesting in the balance sheet, taking more sweep in. And all of this is expensive. It takes time. It's not immediately pleasing for shareholders in terms of nice big dividends and nice big share buybacks. But it is building an incredibly powerful animal that no one else will ever be able to compete with. And in my mind, that's very analogous to Amazon. It's also very analogous to what Munger describes as deferred gratification. None of this had to happen. Charles Schwab could have run an asset like business model that paid out whacking great special dividends to himself and everyone else for the last 15 years. But he hasn't. He's built an incredibly complicated, asset intensive, regulated, tier one equity capital requiring business. But it is one that is hugely dominating its industry in price and service because of all those efforts. Yeah, it's a really interesting point. A lot of times we feature businesses that have hit these inflection points already. It's often the most interesting opportunities in the market are when you have this trend that has gone a certain way, and then you inflect massively in a different direction. So here, putting all that capital back into the business, I'm sure from a book value perspective, all of the metrics kind of get jumbled and look worse off until you hit a point where that process slows down or inflects in the other direction and you start to operate on a normalized basis. How far out does the TD Ameritrade acquisition push that inflection to where more of that capital might be allocated back to shareholders? Reasonable question, impossible to answer. The reason I say that is because not only have you got the TD Ameritrade assets that are coming onto the balance sheet, you've also got a situation whereby periods of cautious markets often result in more clients having higher cash balances. As a result, you need to have more regulatory capital. So it's difficult. And I'm not trying to be obtuse or difficult about it. It's certainly two or three years out, it might be more. I spend quite a lot of time trying to think about what type of business model this is, rather than getting into modeling the balance sheet a long way out. The reason I sort of almost purposely don't do that is because I think that's what everyone else is doing. And that's where they end up in knots because they're trying to model balance sheets. They're trying to model tier one equity ratios. They're trying to model net interest income margins. And that's why that's all the analysts ask about on the calls, because that's what they're trying to build a model for. But actually, that isn't what this is about. It's just about building a network of customers to give the customer the best possible deal you can. And part of that trade-off of giving you a great deal versus me making some money out of it is sweeping those deposits onto the balance sheet. But I don't worry too much about that moment. I think that moment will one day arrive because it was about to arrive before the TD Ameritrade deal. But I don't worry too much about that moment because to bring more deposits onto the balance sheet is still a good thing because you're still making more money out of it. The way that I think about this is these are two businesses rolled into one. So take Buffett's dream and compounder businesses. Part of this business is a dream business. It's a network business with massive economies of scale and very high margins and very high free cash flow generation and returns on capital. And another part of it is effectively a bank or a put up more to make more compounder, if you like. And at some points in time, the business is more about one than the other. If I had to guess, I'd say it's three years out, but it's a guess. I think any type of forecasting is in many ways a guess. And I think that's why this company is difficult in the diligent world of analysis where we build sheets and we model companies, we think about scenarios and we think about interest rates and all the rest of it. By the time you've done two weeks of that with Schwab, your spreadsheet's so big and your brain has exploded, you've sort of forgotten why you like the business in the first place. And I think that is the danger here is that you end up in the sort of world of questions and answers and the search for certainty. I've written recently on Amazon. It's a little bit like Amazon in the sense that if you said to me, you know, what's your profit forecast for Amazon a couple of years' time? I can say, well, I've got a few ideas, but in all truth, I haven't got a faintest idea whether those numbers are 20% wrong or 100% wrong. But what you've got to be right on is directional. You've got to be right on market power. You've got to be right on what the customer thinks and the culture of the business. And you've also got to be right on thinking that at the price you're buying, you've got a reasonable margin of safety in what you're doing. And that's all you can sort of do. Absolutely. I think you bring up a good point there on margin of safety, and it raises a question around valuation. You mentioned before, you believe, and I think it's easy to understand why, this would be a positive for the business. They're making more and more in terms of profitability, but they have to put that back onto the balance sheet in the form of equity. 
while that's still a net positive, especially when you step back, what that's going to do is take the denominator of an ROE equation and make it higher, which is naturally going to depress that ROE metric relative to some of the competitors. How do you think about valuing a business like this, where it is so complex, as you mentioned? What's your approach to thinking about margin of safety and value? I don't agree with the point about putting more capital in and therefore reduces the ROE. I think more capital stays in the business, that's correct. But that isn't necessarily correct that the ROE goes down. Because if part of what's going on with your business is you're investing in technology, you're investing in low prices, you're investing in capital, part of all of that is attracting more clients and attracting more deposits. So I look at it more like what I call a put up more to make more business is the fact that your equity base might be rising over time but still making a good level of return. So your absolute equity rises, but your absolute profitability rises too. And that's completely outside what's going on with net interest, if you like. If you looked at this business over the last 20 years and you said, well, for all that period of time, Andrew, they've had to put capital on the balance sheet, all as long as your spreadsheet goes back, why is your return on equity not gone down the whole time? It's gone down sometimes because net interest margins are lower, but it hasn't gone down because they've grown capital because the whole entity has grown. There's more of everything. There's more deposits, there's more clients, there's more interest income, there's more profits, there's more capital. And it's a sort of circular movement, if you like. Simply a point on all else equal, forget the numerator, which is obviously impacted. The denominator is going up and you had the opportunity for it not to go up just in the short term. It can make it look artificially worse. I certainly hear your point. I think that's kind of one of the keys is there are major long-term benefits, particularly on the numerator here which might get masked in the short term, especially when you have to allocate a higher percentage into the equity portion and keep that within the business relative to an asset like peer. So maybe that framing and how you think about valuation. The problem, of course, with all the valuation work is that everything we've talked about in terms of asset light and asset heavy and building balance sheets and retaining capital is the right discussion to have about this company, if you like, while it's doing a good job for the customer facing it. Sadly, the time that the analysts are right to ask about net interest income is when they're trying to build a profit forecast, because it is the thing that drives profit the most, if you like. The way that we've looked at it is that, as I said, published a variety of different pieces on this company and at a variety of different points in time. But generally, over the last three or four years, interest rates have been depressed. Now, they've been depressed a lot or not very much, depending on exactly where you want to look at. So the net interest margin of Schwab in 2019 was about 2.4%. That was one of the lowest annualized net interest margins until you got to 2021 when it was 1.5%. With a business that makes 60% of its profitability from that line, there's a huge sensitivity to that. So that's why the analysts ask about it and they're not wrong and they're trying to build their profit forecasts. So trying to build a profit forecast in the future that has all the stuff going on with the assets, all the stuff going on with the balance sheet intensity, and then has a huge volatility on net interest income before you even get into trading lines and asset management revenues and all the rest of it is obviously complicated. So the way that I've gone about it is I've basically said, look, well, what does this business make today? And when I say today, I mean, as it was full year 2021 or even in 2020. And what might that number be if I then adjusted for some assumption of interest rates? The Q4 profitability they made pre sort of amortization of intangibles annualized would be about $3.4. And that's just taking their amortization Q4 profit last year and rolling it and compounding it up. It's a bit less if you take Q1. It's probably similar if you take Q3. That gets you to about $3.4 a share. That, however, is a very low net interest margin. So adjusting that for the net interest margin we experienced in 2019 of more like 2.4%, would get you to $5-ish, $5.50. Now, I should just say, look, I don't give investment recommendations. I don't give forecasts. This is just my thought process. So that gets you to about $5. And if you go and look at the analyst forecast for 2023, they're at about $4.9. In 2024, they're about $5.3. So the analysts are adjusting for that interest rate environment. And that's therefore, and against the 40-something dollar share price that you had not long ago and a 60-something share price that you've got now, that's not an unreasonable price to pay. So you're paying sort of 12 times sort of normalized earnings if you want to look at that for what would be 2009 interest rates. There's a couple of puts and calls I'd give you that. One is that if you go back to look at 2000 and 
sorry, when I said 2009, I mean 2019. If you go back to look at 2019 and you look at Fed funds rate then, and you look at the 10 year then, and you look at Fed funds rate now, and you look at the 10 year now, they're either the same or they're quite significantly higher. So it would suggest to you that the NIM that you would experience or look through earnings basis today would be better than 2019. So that might get you to a number more than $5.50. I'm happy to just put that into sort of margin of safety thinking, put that into a sort of a buffer fund, if you want to call it that. But today you're on a $62 stock, you're on a $5 look through earnings number, you're trading on 12 times. But that is for a business that I think grows at mid-teens throughout the cycle. And the company has talked about why you've got that mid teen structure. But once you've got to whatever your steady state earnings number is of interest rates, either it be a stable low level or a stable high level, mid-teens is a very likely outcome as to what this company will grow at. And as I've sort of alluded to, two, three, four years out, that becomes a much more cash generative teens earnings growth as well. To me, for what I think is the Amazon of finance, that is a perfectly good price to pay. Whether I'm wrong and actually I'm paying 10 times look through earnings for it or 14 times look through earnings for it, I don't know. Impossible to be that accurate with this company because you're forecasting a lot of very volatile numbers. But all of those are perfectly reasonable multiples to pay for a business that's got an interest rate tailwind behind it and has got secular growth that's been proven because it is basically a scale economy shared business model. Yeah, I think quoting 12 times if something's growing at mid-teens earnings, I would certainly agree with you there. And again, no stock recommendations here. I am curious to hear about that earnings growth and if there's a way to segment that in terms of what the key drivers are in terms of a growing asset base, growing revenue base, how net interest margins are all playing into that equation. So the company talks about that in their presentation packs and they talk about the assumption is they'll grow assets 5 to 7% per annum. And I think I alluded to it earlier on. One of their most recent presentation packs shows that that's exactly what they've done. They've grown an average 6% per annum for the last 10 years. They talk about some revenue growth on top of that, a certain amount of maybe market movements, but a certain amount of also sort of selling other products, if you like. Despite the fact this company's got a 48% pre-tax profit margin, they think they've got abilities to rise the margin further from here. And that comes back to, as I said, the stuff they talked about post the TD Ameritrade deal, client segmentation, women monetization, that sort of stuff, which they've been a bit more upfront about post the deal completing. And then the final part of the move that gets you from 5 to 7% to more like mid-teens is the asset allocation and is an assumption that they will in time be a business that is effectively buying their own shares back or paying dividends in some quantity or other. My view on that is not just an opinion that I've dreamt up. It is an opinion that the company is happy to discuss and has discussed in more or less detail, depending on what point they are in their asset intensity. But their long-term look through the cycle forecast assumes that they will be a business that is distributing 40, 50, 60% of their earnings by way of either dividends or share buybacks. That's how you get from 5 to 7% asset growth to sort of mid-teens earnings per share growth. Uh, that's incredibly helpful in terms of a breakdown. I think we've gone over some of the competitive risks. I'd be curious to hear how you think about some of the other market risks associated with the business. In terms of the net interest margin and how they're able to earn that spread. Can you just talk a little bit about how that capital is then allocated in order to return that spread? Is there anything in terms of lending that they're doing or something else that could be considered risky or would have exposure to a cycle? Generally, they have been very prudent in how they've run the balance sheet in terms of investing in high-grade bonds and cash and so on, You know, in the way that a bank does with its own tier one ratio as well. TD Ameritrade bought with it a certain amount of margin loans, and they have carried on doing some of those and some customer loans, not in a dissimilar way to something like American Express has done, if you like, in the sense of, we know this customer really well. We've got a lot of good collateral with this customer, so we don't mind doing some lending with them, if you like. But generally, that's a sort of business activity rather than the way to think about how the balance sheet is run. But yeah, the balance sheet is run not in a dissimilar way to any other SEC regulated bank with tier one equity ratios. today. The regulatory requirement is for them to have a 4% ratio. They're at 6.1, I think it is. And I think one of the drags on the share price more recently is the fact that the company has spoken quite openly about more deposits coming in, the clients being more cautious, cash balances building, and as a consequence of which they've got to sit on capital. And I think that is something that shouldn't be that surprising for people, but it does seem to be. It does seem to come as a shock if you look at the fact that the evolution of interest rates throughout the course of this year and the evolution of the swab share price. 
it was very quick and very efficient to move to a point that said, well, hang on a minute, interest rates could be a lot higher. And that's very, very good for Schwab's profitability. To now moving back to a price where, yes, maybe it reflects a bigger washout, maybe in all sorts of different risk assets. But it also reflects the fact that the company is talking about needing to keep capital on its balance sheet for the reasons we've discussed. Yeah, that was the other risk or point that I wanted to discuss. Part of the assumption in terms of that earnings growth is growth in client assets, 5 to 7%. Much of that also depends on the AUM that's in the business, the investments that are already held within the business grow. And we've had the market retreat quite a bit this year. How does that play a role in terms of dollars and cents for Schwab? And how much do you think about it as a risk for the business going through the cycle? Yeah, I mean, Schwab in their investor presentations give specific sensitivities to all sorts of different movements in the S&P, movements in interest rates. That can all be seen by different people. The difficulty you've got is you've got four or five different lines. You've got interest revenue, you've got asset management revenue, you've got trading book and order flow, and you've got sort of deposit fees. Sitting here and just saying, well, actually, the movement of the S&P means that I take X percent off of that number. It's just impossible to be accurate in the sense that there's a lot that goes into trading and order flow. There's a lot that goes into asset management revenue. So is this company affected by less trading activity? Yes, because some of that trading creates revenue, if you like. Is it affected by levels of some indices? Yes, but then obviously it's got bond holdings as well. So you've got some periods of time when bond markets go up and equity markets go down. This is obviously a period of time when both have gone down, if you like. So yes, that is going to affect the assets that you've got under custody, if you like. But acting against that or as a break or an offset on the other side of that is that increased client caution might be increased client percentages of assets held in cash, which is an increase in the amount of money you're making a net interest spread on. It's sort of a natural break that happens when stock markets go down. As the people get more cautious, leave more money in cash, that's what makes more money on the money that's in cash. Overall, do I think that this is a business that you want to be seeing stock markets go down year after year after year? No, of course you don't. But forecasting that in the very long term is a bit like forecasting Buffett's attitude towards markets rising 7% per annum and so on. It's easy to do in that sense because you can get a nice linear view as to how the next 30 years might pan out. Forecasting that short term, I think, is really, really difficult. One of the things that makes it a difficult business is because there are two business models. As I said, there's the scale economy share business model the outside world sees and then the bank business model that the analysts see. But then equally, forecasting it is fraught with difficulty because you've got all these different lines that actually move some of them in correlation with stock markets and bond markets the way you'd expect, and some of them in the opposite direction to what you'd expect. So that's why I try and do sort of ready reckoners that go, well, where was I last year? And where would that fit in terms of the breakdown of the business if I adjusted for a sensible level of interest rates? If that puts you on 20 times earnings, and that's too high a price to pay probably for a business like this. But if it puts you on 12 or 10 or 11 or whatever it is, and you go, actually, yeah, no, that's a great price to pay for a business like this. But to try and be more accurate is, I think, impossible. No, I think you've hit on why this is a complex business, why it may be misunderstood by the market, why it's so interesting, both from a strategic standpoint, going back in time. We wrap these conversations up by talking about the lessons. Are there some major lessons, whether it's one or multiple, that you can point to? over your years looking at this business and approaching it as an investor? I mean, I'm a lover of certain types of businesses. Scale economy shared is one, which is obviously what I think these guys do and what Amazon do. And another type of business is the sort of owner-manager business, which I absolutely love. And I think if I picked out a few lessons from that, that perhaps I've not just seen in Schwab, but I've seen in other companies as well, two of them would be as follows. The first would be that asset heavy isn't always bad. And one thing I've learned in the last few years from a couple of other companies I've looked at is that there is this assumption that everybody wants asset light, everyone wants that sort of SaaS income stream, and everyone's out there looking for return on invested capital of sort of 40% and all the rest of it, and more and more. But actually, there are businesses that Buffett famously described in sort of in his utilities to sort of put up more to make more businesses, where you reinvest, but then you make the same ROE on that. You reinvest and make the same ROE on that. I call that a put up more to make more business. And that's effectively what the bank part of Schwab is. And I think there's a lot of people, I think, who do like franchise businesses 
higher end returns on invested capital notes and all the rest of it that don't look at Schwab, but they don't look at Schwab because they see it as not a high enough return on capital business. That I think is a lesson because if you go back over a long period of time, Schwab has performed brilliantly. And I think I read something the other day that it's in somebody's 100 bagger now because they bought it in 1997 or whatever it was. But it's got those types of characteristics to it while it retained a lot of capital in the business, which I think is sort of a lesson that just says, don't judge every company that has to retain capital the same. And the second lesson I'd have, and for my sins, I own a few companies in the UK like Fraser's and so on, which are seem to be quite controversial businesses. The other lesson I would have is the fact that investment phases in owner-managed companies are not short-term affairs. If you think about an investment phase of new chief executive comes into a business, he's got a three-year plan, he says, we're going to spend for two years, and by the end of year three, I should be making higher margins. And if that happens, everyone pats him on the back and his option scheme vests, and if it doesn't happen, everyone fires him. And that's why quick turnaround schemes are forced to succeed, because the poor chap who's the chief executive knows that his job's on the line if it doesn't. And I think owner-manager businesses have an entirely different culture. I've got businesses in the UK that have had three, four, five, six, seven year investment periods. And the stock market is just pulling its hair out because it's like, well, how on earth could you not be making a return out of this investment yet? And it might be right, it might be wrong, but it's just the founder has a different attitude towards the stock market. And arguably, this is the best example of them all. This is a company that didn't have to be asset heavy from what I can see. It could have run an asset like Hargreaves Lansdowne, TD Ameritrade type business paid out nice big dividends, probably still done a good job for the shareholder and a good job for the customer, and everyone would have been happy. But that's not what they chose. They chose the high road, which was a difficult road. And I think today, I don't really think they get the credit for that, but they may have built something that is absolutely uncatchable. I think that's an excellent place to wrap. One of the reoccurring themes and probably most common on our business breakdowns is debating the merit of asset light and a franchise model versus asset heavy owned and operated model. And this one adds to that list in a very, very interesting way. Andrew, thank you very much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. I've been a fan of the uh, podcast for quite some time. So it's been delighted to, uh, to take part in one. To find more episodes of breakdowns ranging from Costco to Visa to Moderna, or to sign up for our weekly summary, check out joincolossus.com. That's J-O-I-N-C-O-L-O-S-S-U-S dot com.